Okay, so first I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak here. It's a real pleasure. And I will speak about uh, this joint work uh, with Matthias Maives. Uh, yeah, and the title is uh, Braid Stability and the Hofer Metric. So I will, before stating the result, I will start uh, introducing uh, the, what you need to understand the statement. Uh, so the first thing is how to associate a braid to a set of periodic orbits of a Hamiltonian diffeo. So in this case here, we will always be working with surfaces. And in this situation that you can associate a braid to a set of, uh, in our case, it will be a set of fixed points of a Hamiltonian diffeo. It can generalize to periodic orbits. So I start introducing the setup. And ah, just one observation, if anyone has a question, uh, if anything you don't understand, please feel free to uh, encourage to, to ask questions. OK. So the setup is we have sigma omega compact surface endowed with a symplectic form and phi a Hamiltonian diffeo on this on sigma omega. And if sigma has boundary, has non empty boundary, we would demand that uh, for the situation we consider that phi is the identity near the boundary, so in the neighborhood of the boundary. Right? And then uh, we take H, so we fix the Hamiltonian diffeo. I will not define Hamiltonian diffeo, I imagine, uh, <laughs> but if anyone wants, you can, you can ask and I can clarify anything. Yeah. But okay. So we start with the phi the diffeo, and then we choose uh, an H, so a Hamiltonian, a time dependent, right? Uh, S1 dependent uh, Hamiltonian, which generates phi. And by that, I mean that the time one map, right, uh, of uh, the Hamiltonian flow associated to H is, the Ham is phi. Okay. And just uh, for, uh, uh, yeah. we will, in this talk, S1 will be always uh, R associated by Z, okay, just a convention. And then we have P, which is a collection of distinct fixed points of our Hamiltonian if you find. And associated to this set P, to each, so this set P is formed by this distinct point pi, and then I let gamma i uh, be the, um, uh, it's the lift of the orbit, uh, of uh, the orbit starting at pi, right? So for each time t, and this lift will live in S1 across the surface. So for each t per belonging to S1, I will take the point uh, in S1 cross sigma, which with first coordinate t and second coordinate phi t h of pi. So for at time zero, right? So in the surface zero cross sigma, I mean the point pi, zero pi. And then since, the, since pi is a fixed point, when you return, right, to when t equals to one, you are again at uh, pi, okay? So this really gives, uh, for each uh, i, this will give you a, a knot embedded in S1 cross sigma, right? And this knot is always transverse to the surface you obtained by fixing the first code. And the braid associated to the, the set p, and here I denote by, B H of P will be the union of the gamma I, right? Where the X I, the base point on which I start the braid is uh, belonging to P, okay? Since these points are disjoints, are disjoint, right? Uh, since I took a distinct point, I really get the braid in S1 cross sigma. Okay, and here is a representation of a braid in three strands that you would get, uh, for example, get uh, starting with three, with a collection with three fixed points. So it's a possibility. Okay. 
Now, so this gives a way to each, like each collection of fixed points, I get a break. So that's the first ingredient that we need here. And uh, just an observation. So this depends on the Hamiltonian, right? So it's not something uh, which depends only on phi, but it depends on the choice of Hamiltonian uh, H, okay, generating phi. Okay, just quickly recalling, right, what's the Hofer metric, which is this uh, B invariant distance uh, in the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. So if you take phi and phi prime two Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms on your surface, then uh, this metric uh, somehow look at, uh, so how do you do? You look at kind of the minimal amount of energy that you need to deform, right, from phi to phi prime. So I define this set H of phi phi prime as normalized Hamiltonians generating the phi minus one composed with phi prime. Okay, there are, this is one way to, right? And just recalling normalized here means that if you are in a closed surface, the integral of H T of X uh, with respect to the symplectic form omega is zero for every t belonging to S1. So every time I fix the S1 coordinate, I get a function on the surface and I ask that it has average zero. And if you are with non-empty boundary, then what we demand is that, uh, so remember that we, we ask phi to be the identity near the boundary. So what we will demand is that HT or Hamilton will always vanish uh, near the boundary, the neighborhood of the boundary. And then, okay, so the last thing we need is okay, if you have, right, a function f in sigma, you look at this norm, which is the oscillation norm with the maximum of f minus the minimum of f. And the, the Hofer distance of phi phi prime then will be uh, the infimum as h belonging to the set of Hamiltonians that I chose of the integral with respect to t of the oscillation norm, right? So for, for one particular t, the oscillation might be very big, but uh, the, in, the average of this energy has to be, uh, yeah. Okay, if, if they are cl uh, close by, that's what I was saying. If phi and phi prime are close by, if uh, this, uh, the average of the oscillation with respect to the, uh, the S1 coordinate is small, okay? Okay, so here we have already the, what is necessary to introduce the result. So what is braid stability? What uh, this thing that we call braid stability? So it's, it says that if you have phi, a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, ah, and this, okay, everything here is joint work with Matthias Maivis. I, I think I said just that. So if you take phi, so what's break stability? So you take a, a Hamiltonian diffeo phi, sigma omega, and you take a collection of fixed points, and you ask them to be non-degenerate, but the, Ham the Hamiltonian diffeo phi can be degenerate. So you only ask that the fixed points are non-degenerate, the ones you're choosing to generate your break. Then there exists an epsilon such that for every phi prime, which is epsilon close to find the Hofer metric, then you can find a collection of fixed points, which I call P prime for this phi prime, and a Hamiltonian H prime generating phi prime, such that the braid that you get from uh, using H uh, for the collection P is isotopic, freely isotopic as a braid to the braid that you get from P prime uh, with the, the choice of Hamiltonian H prime, okay? So in the statement here, what you're saying is that, okay, you start with phi and P and H, so you have this data, and then you, for any nearby diff of phi prime, you can find a collection of fixed points and a Hamiltonian generating this, uh, this guy and the braid associated to this uh, collection P prime will be the same as the braid you start with, okay? And just to say freely isotopic as braids, what I mean is that 
they will be freely isotopic S links inside S1 cross sigma. And during the whole isotopy, uh, every component is transferred to the, to the surface that you obtain by fixing the first coordinate in S1 cross sigma. So it's like the best notion you could imagine for free isotopy. Right? I'm allowing to move the base point because otherwise you cannot, um, you could not uh, demand that uh, that phi prime would have the same fixed point as phi. This would be impossible. Okay. So you will allow this kind of uh, freedom. Okay. So before explaining the proof and the ingredients, I I will uh, give some consequences of this result. So the first is a theorem there that we proved in the same article in that it's kind of the motivation that led us to study this base stability phenomenon. And it says basically that the topological entropy uh, is lower semi-continuous in the, in the Hamiltonian group of surface uh, endowed with the Hopper metric. So the topological entropy is kind of a measure of uh, the complexity of the dynamics. And it's a number that you associate to any uh, to a dynamical system. So what we're saying is that if you see it as a function on the Hamiltonian group endowed with the topology of the Hopper metric, this will be a lower semi-continuous, okay? And to prove this, you need two things. You need the braid stability, and you need the second result that we also obtained, which was like you approximate the topological entropy of phi of any surface diffeomorphism by the entropy of braids realized as periodic orbits of this diffeomorphism. Okay. This is just, uh, but I, I will mention a bit more of that in the end. And another consequence, which comes from actually from this. Uh, from this lower semi-continuity of the entropy, it, it was observed by uh, Anievsky is that if you look at the set of entropy zero Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms in, uh, in the Hamiltonian group of the surface, so if you look at those which, uh, which don't have complexity from the point of view of entropy, then this is not dense in any open set in the Hofer, uh, Hofer metric, okay? So in some sense, it's saying that uh, this set of entropy zero uh, diffeomorphisms is very thin in the Hofer metric. And even more, you can, uh, the same argument actually proves that if you put the set of uh, maps with bounded entropy, bounded from above by a certain constant, it will not be dense in the, any open set in HAM. So the only way to get dense sets to kind of fill open balls in, uh, in harm is to increase dynamical complexity. So you need maps which have more and more uh, entropy. Okay. And the second uh, result, which was obtained by Hanevsky uh, using the techniques and modifying some of them, is that uh, if you look at uh, auton autonomous Hamiltonians in harm, uh, they are not dense in uh, a DH dense in the set of zero entropy. So this is related to a conjecture of Katok. Uh, it's a version, right? A variation of a conjecture of Katok. But uh, basically, Hanevsky says that uh, there are z he observed that there are zero entropy braids, which cannot be realized by any autonomous Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. And then modifying some of our techniques, he was able to use this braid stability to say, okay, uh, how autonomous cannot feel completely. Uh, the set of zero entropy, uh, Hamiltonian. Okay. And another consequence is this uh, is a corollary of braid stability plus the results of Cinelli, Ginsburg, and Gurel is that since the barcode entropy that they defined is coincides with the topological entropy for surface diffeomor for a Hamiltonian diffuse on surfaces, then this barcode entropy is also lower semi-continuous with respect to the Hopper metric. And this is also not clear. So in general, since uh, 
right? Uh, so just to give an idea of why these results are not uh, obvious is that if you look at uh, Hamilton, uh, perturbations with respect to the Hofer metric, right? You're just asking that they are somehow C0 small for the Hamiltonian. But since the vector field that defines right, the Hamiltonian flow depends on the derivative of the Hamiltonian, you could, uh, the vector field when you perturb in the Hofer metric uh, can undergo quite dramatic changes, right? So it's not clear at all. So the, which kind of dynamical properties of, um, of, a dyna of a Hamiltonian diffusion will be stable when you perturb with respect to the Hofer metric. And so in topological entropy is particularly kind of subtle because even uh, so in higher dimensions, for example, in dimension three, or in dimension two, it's a big theorem. So it's a consequence of quite important results that it's continuous with respect to the synfinity topology in the set of diffeomorphisms, uh, for example, smooth diffeomorphisms. But the moment you go, for example, to CK, finite, uh, finite, uh, differentiability, then uh, continuity doesn't hold in. So it's some, and in higher dimensions, uh, you lose complete control. So there is, in general, there is no, uh, conti for, uh, there is no lower semi-continuity of entropy for higher dimension details. There is for a uh, low dimension, but okay, this is also a result of our talk. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so just, uh, explaining some related results for ours. So the first, uh, so I, what I understand, I, this can be a mistake of my interpretation, but what I understand from the some results of Connery Creek is that uh, he uh, is able to show uh, by defining a spectral invariant that sees the linking number of orbits. So uh, my impression is that it follows from his results that some trivial breaks very special uh, for uh, which uh, are special in terms of homology, the fluid homology for Hamiltonian diffusion are stable. But okay, this uh, the way I understood might be something incorrect. In the second result, which was quite uh, uh, an inspiration for us, though it was by Shore and Mifes, it was about this entropy stability in uh, in Ham. So they showed that for higher genus surfaces, you can always find for any big number n, uh, examples of very large DH balls on Hofer metric balls on which the topological entropy is bounded from below by n. So this was the first example of, uh, of uh, diffeomorphism of Hamiltonian diffusion on which you could not kill the entropy by by a small Hofer perturbation. And it was with these results in mind that we started to try to see if you could generalize this for a larger care for a Hamiltonian diffusion. And it turns out that entropy is always stable. Okay. So now, after giving these kind of motivations, I will go to sketch for a sketch of the proof. So I will try to give um, uh, the proof uh, in the situation to give the main ideas and focus on the situations where uh, some of the things are, which are simpler to see, so that one can get the main idea of how one obtains such a result. So the first step is that periodic orbits survive sufficiently small perturbations in the age, and this we learned from. Uh, results of Puterovich, Shaluhin, Asher, and Asher Zhang. And okay, the basic idea is that if you have a periodic orbit and then you look, uh, let's say you are non-degenerate, right? So the spectrum, it will be a finite set of uh, points. And then if you perturb just a little bit in the Hofer metric, and there has to be, uh, for the new diffusion, there has to be another, there have to be another fixed point with the same index, for example, because they clump from a uh, from certain continuation maps in fluid homology. Okay, they prove something more general, much stronger. They look at a, um, a relation between the bottleneck distance and the Hofer distance. But in particular, 
if you look at a, a very local uh, situation of what they do, you obtain this the stability of periodic of uh, fixed fixed points and periodic orbits more generally. Okay, so how does how does this work? So you start with uh, a collection of fixed points, and here I will look at the most complex uh, situation that you have these fixed points and you cannot distinguish them by action. So you cannot separate uh, them by action, which would make it easier somehow to obtain distinct fixed points in the imperturbed uh, Hamiltonian diffuse. And we assume that all fixed points with that action are in our collection, okay? Then we choose uh, a sufficiently small epsilon such that the spectrum of phi, so the action of uh, one periodic orbits of phi, uh, fixed points of phi, right? intersection with the neighborhood of this A, the special value, which is the action of our chosen orbits, doesn't contain anything but the value A. So we isolated, we use this neighborhood here, right? Where the action of the orbits we are interested is isolated, on which we're interested is isolated. And then we look at the floor homology so localized around this action A. So we look at uh, the forward complex generated by all orbits, right? Which have action between A minus epsilon and A plus epsilon. And this, because of our choice uh, of a P, is actually the Z2 vector space generated by P, right? So, and because every element in this complex has the same action, then there is no floor differential, right? So the floor homology concentrated at this degree, at, uh, at this action window, is matches exactly the floor complex. So the homology is the same as the complex, right? Okay. So now take phi prime, and uh, here, this epsilon here will be the crucial like will be the epsilon that we use. So this action, epsilon which kind of isolates A in terms of action, will be the what will appear in the in the size of the whole problem on which we can guarantee the great stability. Okay, so you take phi prime, a Hamiltonian diffeo, which is non-degenerate. So here we have some degeneracy, and with uh, the Hofer, the distance between phi and phi prime smaller than epsilon, the Hofer distance. Then, because of this Hofer proximity, one can construct a very, uh, very careful, like very special normalized Hamiltonian H prime generated by prime. And together with this Hamiltonian, you construct homotopies. So this homotopy is G and G, and G hat. And this, this homotopies will give you like continuation maps. So they and so G is the homotopy starting at H at minus infinity and going to H prime. And G hat undoes this. So it goes from H prime to H, right? Here at minus infinity to H prime. And because you construct this quite carefully, you will obtain the you will obtain continuation maps that respect certain action windows. And here is that it's crucial that you use proximity in the Hofer. Norm, so we will obtain that phi g will go from the complex, uh, the fluid complex with action between I min a minus epsilon and a plus epsilon for h to the forward complex of h prime, seeing periodic orbits now of uh, fixed uh, points of the perturbed diffio. But then you allow a bit of change in the action. You have to allow this change in the action here to obtain because uh, since you have an, a homotopy now, uh, right, the, the, the floor trajectories for the homotopy doesn't, they don't decrease action anymore. But because you are Hofer closed and you construct this homotopy carefully, they cannot increase too much, okay? And you obtain phi g hat going back from uh, the floor complex of H prime now located at this action window of size four epsilon around A, and it goes back 
right? So the flower homology, the flower complex of H, uh, before to say, like going back from H prime, right, to H. And now you have to increase a bit the action window here, okay? But uh, because of our assumptions on the action isolation, this here is actually equal to CF of H minus epsilon, H plus epsilon of H. A minus epsilon, H plus of H. The reason here is because there is no uh, other element on the spectrum in that, uh, right, uh, be, be other than those who are uh, exactly with X and A. So these two things coincide. And the composition then of these two continuation maps goes from CF, A minus, like the, uh, the flower complex of, uh, for action window epsilon uh, distance from A to do, those of, uh, of action window A minus three epsilon, A plus three epsilon, but this matches the old one. And then if you do the kind of using the same idea that you used to construct these homotopies, you can say, you can see that you can do a chain homotopy between this guy here and the identity on this guy here. Uh, so this map actually induces the identity on the homology. And since uh, and since the the differential vanishes for this complex here, this complex here, the differential vanishes because you don't everyone has the same action. This composition is actually the identity. Okay. Good. Uh, so the conclusion is. Because you have to, you have uh, like a, an isomorphism between this guy and itself that goes through this this complex here. So there has to be enough orbits here uh, so that you can go with an isomorphism through that, right? And this gives you a lower bound already on the dimension of the flower complex in action window a minus two epsilon a plus two epsilon of h prime it has to be at least as big as the dimension as the number of orbits of p the number of orbits that you started with okay so this gives you already a view that you have many periodic many fixed points of h prime in the appropriate action window that you could try to use to right to find find the right break so this already gives you that uh, these fixed points survive and now out of these fixed points which are in this good action window here we want to find the right ones so that you give that you have the same break type right and this is this is where uh, we started okay so there is a combinatorial lemma that says that uh, the following thing, that you can find among the fixed points there of H prime, because you have at least n of them. So you can find n distinct ones of H prime and the permutation of the set one to, uh, to n, right? The set that you are using to index the fixed points such that there is a floor cylinder of G of the homotopy, and this floor cylinder, cylinder is denoted by UI, and it connects the orbit PI to the orbit PI prime. Okay, so that's how you choose the orbit PI prime. And there is also a G flow, a G hat floor cylinder that we call VI that goes from PI prime to some other P sigma I. Now, to get these floor cylinders, there is a price to pay, is that you might have to change. You cannot guarantee that you go from PI to PI prime and then to go back from PI prime to PI. So you might have to change the orbit, in the fixed point of, of phi that you started with. And that is a situation here that I made a drawing. And this is a situation that could happen. I will explain the drawing soon. That 
but shows that you really need to consider permutations. So the situation is the following. You imagine that you have the start with, uh, for, for phi here, you have only two fixed points, P1 and P2. And for, uh, so this is phi, this is phi prime. And in phi prime, you have three fixed points, okay? And there is, and then, and, and each, uh, so this graph here, each trajectory will be a flower cylinder. So here you have flower cylinders of G, like I drew here, and here you have flower cylinders that give you the continuation map for G hat. And for this configuration here, and there is no reason that such a configuration could not happen, so it satisfies everything that you can demand from a flower theoretical perspective. Uh, but the result is that there is no way that you can go from P1 to P1 and from P2 to P2 in a, going the middle to the orbits here. Okay, so there is no way to find. Uh, and the idea is that I don't want to choose flower cylinders because the braid stability, the braid isotopy will come from the continuation, right? From the flower cylinders. So that's the reason why I ask the PI prime, they are all different. Okay, so and so the only connection here between P1 and P1 is going through this orbit here. And the only connection from P2 to P2 is going to the same. So the only way to get like uh, distinct asymptotics, distinct orbits, is that you go from P1 to P1 prime, and then you go to P2 to go back to P2. So the permutation is non-trivial, and here P2 goes to P2 prime, and then it has to go to P1. Okay. So this is saying basically that uh, uh, that you in some situations you really have to consider these permutations. So, okay, like I mentioned, it's the flower cylinders which will give you the, the braid isotopy. So how do you get this braid isotopy for the flower cylinders? So UI here goes from the orbit PI to PI prime and VI goes from PI prime to P. Okay, so when you lift here the this, you have to consider special, uh, almost complex structures in R1, R cross S1 cross sigma. So they depend on G and G hat. So you have two of them. And, but uh, for example, all UI will be uh, holomorphic cylinders for the same complex structure in this guy. And all VI, for, which is this one, for the same complex structure on this simplexation here, R cross S1 cross sigma. And all the VI will be holomorphic in this complex structure here. So this is usually called the Gromov tree. It's how you go from flower cylinders in a surface to holomorphic cylinders in something in right uh, in R cross S1 cross the surface. Okay, and this like this U tilde I is the graph of UI, and this PI will be like the graph. B to the I will be the graph here. Yeah. Okay. So and then for uh, for the argument that you use, you actually take U to the I and B to the I, and you compactify it to compact cylinders inside R. So uh, in, inside the two-point compactification of R cross S one cross C. Okay. Cross uh, sigma, you have a stable Hamiltonian structure that associates, like, uh, whose rib flow will be the same, uh, will be given or determined by the Hamiltonian flow of H or H prime. And these guys will be kind of holomorphic cylinders for this thing. And they will be asymptotic to the periodic orbit of certain lifts, right? Uh, the lifts that you use to form the braid uh, of the of the one periodic orbits of the Hamiltonians, okay? 
So some facts that we need in order to prove braid stability, and these are not hard, for example, is that UI and V uh, U over line I and V over line I are embedded cylinders in R cross S1 cross sigma. And this is because they are graphs. So this comes, for example, directly from the fact that they are graphs. They are obtained as graphs of cylinders in the surface. And if you look at intersection points of UI uh, sorry, here there is a mistake. So what I want here is UI and U U overline I and U overline J. So any intersection point that this holomorphic curves will have in this uh, in this kind of uh, stable Hamiltonian board, which is R cross S1 cross sigma, they have to be in the interior domain of the cylinders. And the reason is that if you look at what happened to this uh, UI, uh, and you look at the asymptotic behavior, right? What happens near the punctures of the cylinders? So UI, so this guy, it will be asymptotic to an orbit uh, P of PI uh, negatively. And this will be asymptotic to the, which is like the orbit here, which I denoted there, the component of the braid, which I denoted by gamma I. And this will be asymptotic to a completely different orbit. So they are distant. At, at minus infinity. And this, they also have different asymptotics at plus infinity because uh, at plus infinity, they will detect the, uh, the periodic orbits corresponding here to P i, P prime i. And here we'll detect, so this is minus infinity, this is minus infinity, plus infinity. Plus infinity, we'll, we'll see the periodic orbit P J prime. So the asymptotics, what is important is that the asymptotics are separated because of the way we chose the cylinders and that how we selected this point P prime, P prime I. And every intersection point between the cylinders has to happen in the interior. And since the cylinders are holomorphic, you have that all such intersections are positive. Okay, so. Here, and that is a picture of how the cylinders look like. So what is U over line I? So I take the periodic orbit of A, of H starting at PI, right? One periodic orbit. And then I add this S1 component to see it in the three manifold. Then I get gamma I, which is this, this uh, component of the link that you start. So at minus infinity, U over line I is seeing this orbit, and at plus infinity is detecting gamma prime I, which is what I obtain as lifting to S1 cross sigma of the O1 periodic orbit now of, uh, of H prime starting at prime I. Okay. And P over line I goes from gamma prime I to this other orbit of the set P. Okay, so this other element of the break. Could not guarantee that it's the same. Uh, okay. So, in the positivity of intersections, says that uh, the UIs, or V, uh, so if you have UI. intersection uj for line, this has to be in the interior and it has to be positive. So it counts positive, right? The intersection number of this is always bigger or equal to zero. If there is an intersection, it will be positive. Okay, so the second thing I want to say, uh, one thing I want to say here is that if you restrict to one cylinder here, this U over line I, and you look at what's, how the cylinder is behaving in S1 cross, uh, in R cross S1 cross sigma. So if you fix the S coordinate here, okay, since it's a graph, this will be a knot inside uh, 
So this is inside S cross S1 cross C. Okay. So for each choice of S, this is a knot. And it's deforming the knot gamma I to the knot gamma I prime. Okay. So here it's a knot isotopy. There is no problem. Nothing can happen in the sense that there will be an intersection in the middle. So they, because they always intersect, uh, they're always transverse to a certain surface. So, okay, this is not uh, hard to see that it's, it's, it's a nice knot isotopy. And what's more complicated, what prevents U over line I? So each of them separated, it's a nice knot isotopy. But in order to obtain a, a braid isotopy or link isotopy, whatever, then you would need to, that they all together, all these cylinders together, you need to prove that they give you a braid isotopy. You would need to obtain that these uh, U over line I and U over line J do not intersect. If they intersect, then they are changing the braid type of the orbit U, of, the or, of the braid type of P will not necessarily be the same as the braid type of P prime. So you have to get uh, to, to prove that this, this, uh, yeah. this holomorphic ceilings that don't intersect. If you can prove that, then you improve from an isotopy of each component, a not isotopy of each component to a link isotopy. Okay, so for here, I'll give an easy, I'll give you how you prove the easy case, how do you prove that these cylinders don't intersect in the case that your surface is the closed disk, okay? So what you do is that, uh, okay, the problem is, so the first thing, uh, the cylinders, they go uh, from right, uh, like I said here. So they go from gamma i to gamma i prime, and then they go back to gamma i prime to gamma sigma i. So this is a different component of B of BP, okay, so you went back. Okay, so what we do is that we have this, this kind of thing that you peel up the holomorphic cylinders. So you choose a number N, which is the order of uh, your permutation. Then you concatenate two N copies of W, W being uh, the compactification of R cross S1 cross sigma, right? So you add the, this is homeomorphic to, you can think about this as homeomorphic to an interval, a closed interval cross S1 cross sigma, okay? And then we put the cylinders on top of each other. So in the following order. So I start with the holomorphic cylinder uh, U over line I, then on top of it, I have to put something so that these asymptotics, the negative asymptotic of this guy matches the positive asymptotic of the guy below. So it has to be V over line I. And then here you are starting at a different orbit. So what do you do? You, you take the cylinder, the fluid cylinder that starts at this orbit, right? And you take the lift, the holomorphic cylinder that to be of uh, asymptotic negatively to gamma sigma i, okay? And then you, on top of it, you put V over line sigma i, and then you go doing this all the way until you obtain U over line sigma n minus one. So here I'm almost uh, in the order of the permutation. And this V hat will be positively asymptotic so the positive asymptotic is here is actually gamma sigma to the n i, which is this since uh, this guy here is the order of the permutations, means that now I finally come back to gamma. So that means, and from this, I obtain a collection of cylinders in these uh, stacked copies, right? This, uh, how do you call this? this it's like a building, right, of, uh, of Ws. And for each component of the link, so here, uh, I should put I here. So for each component of the link, I get a cylinder in something which is also 
homeomorphic to I cross S1 to a closed interval cross S1 cross sigma, and which is goes from gamma I to gamma I. So at the, the negative end, it is at the negative uh, boundary, it's seeing gamma I, and at the top, so in the bottom, we see gamma I, and it's also seeing gamma I. Okay, so for each, so you get a collection of uh, of cylinders. So this collection here, maybe I write here. Uh, right, sigma I is almost, okay. So for each I, so you get the collection, you get the collection C1, C2, for each component of the braid until you get Cn, okay? And okay. Now, because there is no topology on the disk, I can homot I can homot uh, CI the cylinder with ends fixed to the straight cylinder, which I call C zero I, over the orbit gamma I. Okay, so this is a cylinder that goes from gamma I to gamma I, but it does a lot of things in the middle. But there is a trivial cylinder that you obtain by taking R cross sigma I R cross gamma I. You can, it's analogous in this situation to do, to what is the trivial cylinder in the simplectization of a rib flow, for example, okay? And uh, the idea here is that because there is no topology on the disk, any two cylinders, if you fix the, if you take a cylinder, uh, two cylinders with the same asymptotics, they will be homotopic. Okay, through cylinders with fixed asymptotics, so the, with ends fixed. Okay. This implies, uh, okay, so this is an important piece of information. Okay. Now, positivity of intersections says that any of these two, if any of, uh, if you take i different from j and you look at uh, the intersection number between CI and CJ. So they have different asymptotics, so you can uh, talk about the intersection number. And this is always positive because any such uh, intersection will be like an interior intersection of some of the, the levels of this, this uh, concatenation here, okay? And since these guys are holomorphic cylinders for the same complex structure on that level, uh, if you have an intersection, then the intersection will count positive. But the intersection number of CI and CJ is the same as the intersection number of CI0, the trivial cylinder of gamma I, and the trivial cylinder CJ0 of gamma J. But these are clearly disjoint. So these are like uh, trivial cylinders over distinct rib orbit if you were in a situation of a rib flow of a stable Hamiltonian structure. So this guy here, there's clearly no intersection. So this has to be zero. And this, they are uh, asymptotic. They are, uh, right, this homotopy between CI and CI0, this homotopy here between CI, CI0, it's with the ends fixed. So the intersection number of these two guys is the same as the intersection number of and then they, it's zero, okay? So in the case of the disk, the conclusion is any intersection would be positive, but you know that the intersection of the total thing has to be zero. And this implies that there can be no, no intersection in the, from the start, okay? So U over line I and U over line J do not intersect at all for I different than J. And then the cylinders, you you can now we just prove that you can improve right the fact that these cylinders were not isotopies for its asymptotics but now since they are not isotopies and they don't intersect they are actually a link isotope okay inside the three manifold and they give you the braid isotope so okay the bottom line here is that uh, in this situation if you want to braid isotopy you should look at uh, floor cylinders, okay? So what gets a bit more complicated in the case where you have a surface, which is not a disk, is that, okay, then you cannot guarantee this step anymore here. 
in more complicated surfaces, depending on the on the homotopy class of your one periodic orbit, uh, there might be cylinders which are not the you cannot deform to the straight cylinder. So you have to be more careful to choose your you your uh, fluid cylinders there so that you can guarantee that uh, there's no intersection or you have to find a variation of the R. But this here somehow pretty much uh, solves the case for the disk. This is a, an honest account of what's happening in the, in the disk. Okay. So some comments, like I said, the braid isotope is given to us by the floor cylinders. And the second point is that deadly because they are given by these floor cylinders and these floor cylinders have small energy, but this doesn't mean in any sense that gamma i and gamma i prime are close in the sense of magic. So you cannot guarantee that the braid you obtain here, right? The braid you obtain for the new Hamiltonian diffio or that each component will be close by to the initial braid. So it's more complicated than, than that. If that was possible, this, the result would be much easier. But uh, what positivity of intersections is telling us is that even if your cylinders travel far away, uh, they, they still get, they, they still give you an isotope, which is, so the, the topology is preserved, even if you cannot guarantee that you're close by in any kind of metric sense. Okay. Now I give you, uh, I'll give, try to give a bit of an explanation of why we, we looked at braids, why we want to prove that braids are stable. And this comes from the relation between braids and surface dynamics, right? So how do braids appear when you're studying surface dynamics? So if you got lost in the, in the other, uh, explanation of the proof. Now I'm starting from zero, so it's a good moment if you want to, to start uh, paying attention again. So if you have Q, any collection of points on sigma, right? I can look at the mapping class group of sigma Q, which are isotopy classes of diffeomorphisms of sigma that preserve the set Q. So it might not preserve, in the situation I'm saying here, you don't have to take uh, these maps, don't have to take Q1 to Q1, but they have to preserve the set Q, the finite set of it, right? And then you look what happens when you, what, like uh, the isotopy class of maps fixing this, uh, this set. So I'm allowed to deform, but not to move points in this set, okay? And this is the mapping class group of the surface sigma with the points Q. And if you have no empty boundary, like in the case of the disk, we will assume that the diffuse preserve each uh, boundary component. Okay, so they don't move the boundary component. They are allowed to move elements of Q, but not to exchange elements of Q, but they are not allowed to exchange boundary components. Okay. Now let BRQ be the grade, the group of braids based on Q, right? So just made the drawing here of that way I had to show it up uh, in the beginning of the talk. And that would be like, how do you concatenate trace? So you imagine that one, uh, you put one top of the other, right? Okay. So Birman gave us a relationship between the braid group and the map of Q, based at Q, and the mapping class group of sigma uh, in Q. Okay, so how do you get diffuse from a braid? You push uh, the points, you take the point Q, uh, the points in Q, each QI, QI, right? And you push them on the surface along the braid, okay? So you push them like the braid is telling you to do. And this will give you, over the curves of the braid, this will give you a time-dependent vector field on the surface. And you can extend this vector field like you want. And you get a diffio of sigma. And since it's following the braid, what's braiding is telling you to do, right? On the points Q, uh, then this, uh, this diffeomorphism really preserves Q. And then to get the map that Birman defined, you have to see that, uh, that the homotopy class, right? The isotopy class of this diffu uh, 
uh, doesn't depend on the extension or doesn't depend on the braid up to isotopy, right? If you isotopy one braid to the other, then you should get the same mapping classes. And this is all contained in the work of Birman. And okay, so dynamics is sometimes called this phi, this map phi here, right? The phi of beta is sometimes called the braid type of beta by the dynamics, by dynamics. But okay, so actually, when you can look at uh, uh, the mapping class element quotiented by uh, uh -huh. conjugations in the mapping class. So this is actually the braid type. So, that's, uh, so you should quotient it by. Uh, by A conjugation. Okay. And the great thing about this, uh, this discovery of Birman is that one can use dynamics to study braids and the other way around, right? And that's why, okay, so in our case, we're first using uh, braids to study dynamics, okay? So, for example, from Nielsen Thurston theory, right, we know that for each element, of the mapping class group, one can look at the minimal topological entropy for all uh, diffeomorphisms which are in that mapping class. Okay, and that is this, this minimum. This is not just a minimum, but it's really a minimum, and this is realized by the topological entropy of the thurston nielsen representative. So, for example, if you are on a pseudo anosov class, this will be the minimal entropy will be the entropy of the pseudo of element. Okay, so I'm not defining here as topological entropy, but okay, for to understand at least the idea of this, you don't need the definition. And then using this, you can also define the topological entropy of a braid beta, which will be the entropy, right, of the mapping class, which will obtain from beta by this point pushing process of beta. Okay. And then what we, yeah, so the fact that you have, okay, so the fact that you have certain, that you, what does this re, kind of result can tell you from the dynamics? Sometimes just by knowing that you have one braid with certain properties, you can guarantee that, that one, that uh, uh, a diffeomorphism has a set of fixed of periodic orbits, which realize a certain braid, sometimes you can deduce directly from that that the map has positive end, so there is complicated dynamics, right? And this result, uh, which we proved with Matthias in the same paper, was that if you take phi to be a C2 diff of a compact surface, then the topological entropy of phi can actually be recovered as the supremum of the topological entropy of all the braids realized as periodic orbits of phi. So you can recover the entropy of the map from the entropy of the braid of its periodic orbit, okay? You need actually a supremum here. For most maps, you cannot find one braid that will give you the whole entropy, but you need to take more and uh, like you have to change the braid, take more and more complicated braids to obtain uh, to recover the topological entropy in the limit, okay? And the proof of this is a mixture of uh, techniques of CATOC. This comes from non-uniformly hyperbolic dynamics that give a very precise picture of what happens for the dynamics of a surface diffeomorphism as a consequence of topological entropy. So you have a horseshoe, so you have some kind of uh, geometric picture of set on which the dynamic of which the entropy is concentrated and you know how the dynamics work there you have a, a symbolic model for the dynamics and then when you mix that with an idea a very beautiful idea of frank's handle which uses nielsen theory you can recover you can show that uh, this uh, you can recover the entropy from the brakes so i forgot to mention here but there is a we were okay what inspired us to believe that something like this was true is work of Toby Hall, um, other than the works also of Frank and Handel. So Hall obtained this paper called The Creation of Horseshoes, where he showed that for, for the horseshoe, for certain particular systems, 
he could obtain this result. So in special cases. And these special cases are really important. So for example, directly from whole results, you know that if you have entropy, there are complicated braids. There are braids with positive topological entropy, pseudo uh, braids which have pseudo components. And then uh, inspired by that, we try to analyze, okay, can we go beyond what Hall had done and extend it to more G surface, uh, my general surface tissues? And turns out that if you combine the techniques of Katok uh, with this method of Franks and Handel, then you could uh, take a strict general case. So with the, uh, the punchline somehow for all this, uh, these considerations is that dynamics carried by a braid because of this braid stability will be stable with respect to Hofer's ball perturbations, okay? So we concentrated on topological entry, but there are other types of, there are other dynamical properties that are carried by braids. For example, that is this partial order on the set of braid types defined by Boliland. Basically it says that if you have one braid as a peri periodic orbit, then there are other braids which will be forced by this braid. So there is a lot of orbits which appear in consequence of uh, the appearance of a simple braid. There's a lot of orbits with kind of rich topology, okay? And combined with braid stability, this is saying that all this dynamic structure has to survive when you perturb it with respect to the Hofer, all the dynamics which is associated to the braid you're studying. And uh, yeah, this is not clear from, uh, from uh, if you just look at the Hofer map, okay. So I see that I already finished my time and then I had, uh, I have, yeah, what I had extra was to talk about what we are trying to well, develop uh, in the future from that. But I will stop here if we have time for questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so, uh, well, what are your times, uh, plans for future? So. Ah, okay. So one thing we would, we are kind of actively pursuing is uh, looking at reflows in dimension three. So there is no Hofer metric, but there is something which at least from the dynamical point of view looks very similar. I mean, which is the C zero distance on the space of contact forms. And the problem in reflow, I mean, the interesting thing in, in dimension three for reflows is that you have, I mean, you don't have any more this braid forces entropy. You cannot have, uh, there is not, uh, yeah, in three dimensions, this, this cannot work. There are reasons, for example, why you can find flows realizing uh, by work of an arrangement, for example, you can find flows realizing any link that you want, but having finite number of periodic orbits. So in the, uh, volume preserving category. There's already no force in theory, but in the contact category, in the reflow category, there is something which is the transverse links. So if you look at the transverse link, the, the link with some topology, right? The simple topology that comes from the choice of particular transverse presented, this can force H top and force topological entropy. This was done in work, uh, joint work with Abdor Finapazov, myself and Finapazov, using the, uh, this homology on the complement of links defined by al -Mumin. Very beautiful work of al -Mumin, and uh, there's a lot of things that you can do, and uh, one of them is this. <laughs> and so it's, this is still unpublished, but, uh, and, and Matthias is writing the results, but he obtained a really amazing result, which is that if you look at the topological entropy of, a synfinity generic rip flow, then you can recover it from this contact homology on the complements of links. So you need to take to obtain the whole topological entropy. You need more and more, uh, more and more complicated links. But you, the idea is that uh, yeah, you can recover the topological entropy in a symplectic way by looking at the transverse classes that are realized. Uh, transverse link classes that are realized periodic orbits. And then what we are working now, for example, 
jointly with Matthias, Lucas da Hinden, and Abror, is obtain analogous of great stability for C0 perturbations of this 3D contact form. So this is work in progress, and there are some things we can prove, but yeah, we have a, yeah, we would like to, to obtain something which is like at least a dynamical stability. Say that uh, the H top is lower semi-continuous with respect to this C0 distance. So this would be at something. So Matthias already did in this, uh, this is quite amazing, I think, uh, a half of this work, which is really much harder here than in the situation for Hamiltonian tissues, is that you can recover uh, the, the topological answer from a purely symplectic thing from the lower theoretical invariance. And now the other half, which are working, have some results, but okay, I don't want to say that we, yeah, we have a strategy and we still have to check that all the details are correct <laughs> to say that. And then in higher dimensions to do, uh, like for a Hamiltonian diffuse in higher dimensions, then almost nothing is known. So we have some examples of symplectic manifolds where you can find DH open sets on which H top is bounded from below, but these are very special symplectic manifolds. So it's really some. <laughs> And uh, yeah, they're very special examples. I don't know if the behavior these examples have. Uh, so this is uh, constructed with Matthias, but it's also not uh, uh, available yet. We're still working. And uh, so, yeah. So, okay, we don't, so let's just explain. We don't believe that H top is lower semi-continuous with respect to the whole for metric in, the, in higher dimensions. That is, but there is no known counterexample. So, <laughs> so this is really believed, right? <laughs> there is not so many, so there are, yeah, but okay, everything that uh, guarantees uh, stability in, the, in lower dimensions fail in higher dimensions. And the topological entropy is not continuous anymore in higher dimensions in like synfinite topology. So, uh -huh. So this, but okay, it would be nice to have examples to show that it's really not lower semi-continuous, that you can decrease the entropy of some examples uh, quite drastically with small rougher perturbations. But okay, there is this conjecture that I, we started to think following these observations of Hanievsky is that at least this might be not too much to ask, is that if you look at the Hamiltonian diffuse with zero entropy in higher dimensions, uh, this would not be dense in any open ball. So that in any open ball, you can find uh, examples with robust entropy. You can find a sub ball there with robust entropy that you, so this entropy zero guys could not enter there. So that's, that's something, okay, that's really kind of uh, just a question in the moment, but yeah, looks, uh, it's something that we like to think for the future. Yeah, and I should also mention, I forgot to say that, okay, uh, the idea of looking at lower semi-continuity of entropy and for, uh, for Hamiltonian diffuse in this Hofer metric and for rip flows on the C0 distance is actually coming from a question of Leonid who asked this question. And uh, that's how we got uh, started working on that. Okay, so that's kind of what we have. <laughs> Or, uh, okay, thank no. you very much. So, questions, please. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a question. <clears throat> so, there are two sort of natural generalizations of the statement you proved, and I was wondering if you think these are true or interesting. So, so first, um, if I understood correctly, the braids you looked at all come from a bunch of fixed points of uh, diffeomorphism. But you could also make a braid coming from a bunch of periodic orbits of diffeomorphism. So the first statement would be that those braids are also uh, stable with respect to the Hofer norm. And, and then the second statement would be for, and maybe this is what you meant and what you just said, that for contact form, if you have a bunch of ray orbits that form some link in the contact three manifold, and then you do a, a C0 small perturbation of the contact form, then you get another collection of ray orbits, which is isotopic as a transverse link. 
Uh, so yeah, so okay, that's uh, I, I. So the first thing, the, let me first uh, the first question. So uh, actually, it's uh, the first question is already contained here because just just uh, so that I explain how is that in, if instead of looking at phi, you look at the iterate of phi. Right, phi n, it will be also Hamiltonian diffio, and then you have this collection of of fixed points for this iterate, which will be the points in the periodic orbit of your uh, uh, of the periodic of phi. So look at phi n, and you prove rate stability for phi n instead of phi for a collection of fixed points. And does it make sense? Yeah, so I thought about yeah. that, but it, it's not obvious to me that the the rate isotopy for phi to the n gives rise to a rate isotopy. Ah, okay. That that's a good point. Okay. From the dynamics, from the there is the dynamical result that uh, that we had in mind, this was sufficient. But it's a good so we had a different approach that really Sorry, uh, my, uh, Michael, you, you are too fast. Could you please repeat the sentence? So my sentence was that. If you have a braid isotopy for phi to the n, so that's like in the mapping torus of phi to the n, it's not obvious to me that that gives rise to a braid isotopy for phi in the mapping torus of phi. Mm, I see. No, I uh -huh. see. I see. I see. I think that's I a good point. Yeah, interesting. Uh -huh. So uh, there was a different approach in which, for analyzing like like periodic orbits. Uh, Right, uh, n periodic orbits of phi, we could use uh, almost complex structures with a certain symmetry. And what I would say is that, uh, no, no, yeah, I think this point you made is actually quite good. And it's not to always be the case that uh, to obtain the isotopy from the picture I said. But for pseudo anos of braids or braids with a pseudo anos of component, I think that we, we can prove that. For more general braids, then I we don't know at all how to prove. Uh, that would be yeah, the honest answer. For the, but then we need different techniques. So we need to look at a, a homology to it, which sees this symmetry that you're looking at the iterate somehow. And uh, for pseudo analysis of rates, using a different approach, which really relies heavily on Ziffer intersection theory, for example, uh, we believe we can do. But OK, it's also not written down completely. <laughs> So, but for the general case, I really have no idea for a braid, for example, a torus braid, um, yeah. our approach fails completely. <laughs> like I, I would want to try to use PFH, but I don't know if it will work. But... Okay, okay. Oh, thanks. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a good, uh, <laughs> I'll take a look. We'll take a look for sure. More questions, please. Uh, and should I say something about the question you said about uh, rib flows uh, that Michael had yeah, also Yeah, 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 I'd be interested to hear that too, sorry. So maybe I can explain, okay, so the way I see it nowadays is that when you perturb, you imagine that you have just one component, so just a transverse knot, and when you perturb it, you obtain something. Uh, so what the something that we are currently working will be a transverse link with multiple components. So the number of components can grow. And even if you have only one component, we have no way to prove that uh, for the, the perturbed rib flow, we have no way to prove that it's transversely isotopic. What we can prove under some hypothesis is that so the, what we have in mind somehow inspiring us that uh, the entropy, like the cylindrical contact homology on the complement of what um, wha of what appeared from that initial orbit should be, or the linearized contact homology on the complement of this should be isomorphic to the cylindrical contact homology of the transverse knot that you started. Mm -hmm. So this is somehow much weaker than getting a, right a transverse isotopy, and even if for okay, if we are interested only in the entropy of in the stability of uh, of H top, you don't even need to go to the cylindrical contact homology. You could have like to say that the homologies are uh, are uh, isomorphic. You could just say that there are enough orbits 
for the new perturbed guy on the complement of this link, which had more components than the initial one. So the, the, the picture there is really uh, quite uh, open, but we can prove something is like whatever appears from this orbit, we'll have a lot of orbits in the complement. So that's kind of, uh, but this kind of more, uh, yeah, more uh, topological picture is still, yeah. I think there's still a lot of work that uh, has to be done and could be done. I think it's an interesting thing. To try right. to get thank a more clear you. picture of what happens there. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, more questions? <laughs> 